Hello, I'm Sue Anstis and this is the Game Changers podcast. Now entering its fifth year, the Game Changers continues to evolve. Once again, in 2023, the podcast provided a safe space for elite female athletes and trailblazers in women's sport to share their stories and explore critical issues around equality and inclusion. The impact of the podcast was also recognised by Sport England, who awarded Fearless Women a three-year grant to create a further nine series of The Game Changers. Ahead of a new series launching next month, here are some of our highlights from 2023. Preeti Shetty, a director at Brentford Football Club, shared her first experience at a club game. I didn't have a club, and so I decided I wanted to support my local club. I went to Goldsmiths, my local club is Millwall, and I went to a game and it was really one of the most horrific experiences I have ever had in my life. Like somebody spat at me. Oh my God. I'd gone with like a you know, group of people from uni and I was really uncomfortable and I felt like I didn't belong and I felt like they didn't want me. This was a long time ago. But I had just a horrible experience and I left the, the stadium and I said to, you know, my my kind of housemates. I never want to do this ever again. Like, this was horrible and I don't want to go. And maybe it's not for me. You know, not that football isn't for me, but maybe club football isn't for me. And that, I think, would have maybe been the end of it. But I happened to live with uh, one of the guys in in my dorms was a a Bolton Wanderers fan. And he was incredibly lovely. And he would invite me to go. And they were in the Premier League at the time. They actually finished sixth that season. He invited me to watch all the games with him. And he was really welcoming and... You know, he would explain things to me that I didn't even know where Bolton was. I had just moved to London. But they were doing really well. And I was a really big JJ Okocha fan. And, and JJ was, you know, was playing for Bolton. And it just, it felt like, and he was nice. And at the end of the season, he gave me a Bolton shirt with JJ Okocha on the back. And I still have it. Aww. And so I decided I was going to be a Bolton fan. And I still am, right? And when people ask me, they're always like, why? Do you even know, like, what was the connection? Are you from Bolton? No, the connection was someone made me feel welcomed. And that, I think, is the real power of what football can do. It made a, you know, brown girl from Dubai feel really welcome. And the irony is he's Welsh. (laughs) He wasn't even from Bolton either. Preeti also shared the pressure she faced as a woman building a technology business in sport. I think the parallels between sport and tech are absolutely fascinating, especially in that they are both quite male-dominated industries. I saw it most clearly when I was looking for money, when I needed to find the funding. And I found that I really saw the downsides, I guess, for lack of a better word, of being a young woman of color, because people kept asking about my track record. And they and I was like, what do you, I've run this business for eight years. I don't know what more you want. And they kept asking about, you know, a, a bit like my pedigree. Then that was very much in question. I thought it should have been about the business. I I run a profitable business. I have no startup has that. I have eight years Mm. worth of, I have clients. But it became all about me. And all of the questions were around me, the individual. And like things like whether I am married or not. So my partner owns our flat. And it was like, oh, can you put the flat in both of your names? And there was all of this like weird stuff that was, but I, I understand why it's because I was asking for a lot of money, but it felt very personal. It felt very individual and a lot of people like just hung up like a lot of people wouldn't even engage and I think that was quite difficult I don't you know I think anybody start buying a business starting a business it's complicated but equally something I struggled with especially in that early period was I didn't really feel there were that many people I could talk to that had a similar experience they were you know the sector like the day I announced officially the upshot and the CEO of upshot, the upshot sale, I was actually really touched by quite a lot of CEOs in sport, mostly men, reached out on LinkedIn and emails, even ones I didn't know, just saying, hey, well done, if you ever need to talk, I'm here. And I found that lovely. My issue was there wasn't anybody that was in my position, having to raise the money, being a woman, being a woman of color, in such a bizarre situation at one point in the kind of legal negotiations with the Football Foundation, I was employed by the Football Foundation, negotiating a buyout with my own lawyers. Like it was, there wasn't anyone that I could talk to, and I found that quite difficult. Paralympic legend Ellie Simmons 
called for us to be more open in talking about the impact of periods for female athletes. What I learned later on in life, we're going from Rio to, to, to Tokyo, and I think maybe age had a massive factor. Is like being a woman as well and being on your period, that really affected my training. I used to take it really, really out on myself when sessions didn't go well. But then also now, well, when I was older, I used to think, we're not robots, are we? There's some days where sessions aren't going to go well. Like our body's not going to be on it all the time. We're just going to have those sessions where you just don't swim well and there's no other reasons. But especially like when I was on my period and like, again, I said, mentioned my coach knew me from so, so many years and he would be like, Elle, are you feeling okay? Like what's coming on? Like what time of the month is it? All that type of stuff. And we were a really great to have that open relationship and talk about those types of stuff because I think being a woman in sport is 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 tough when you're on your period or coming on your period and stuff and yeah I think it's not really spoken about much I mean it's great to hear you're talking about it but it is it does feel like right now with the work that the likes of Emma Ross and uh, Georgie Brunville and others are doing in this space is we are now beginning at last to have those conversations around bodies and periods and how we how it impacts it's madness isn't it that it wasn't talked about in the past yeah I know it is crazy but like you said there's some amazing women and people that are searching and doing some research and finding out because it does it does have a massive impact and so many people are different like for me I always used to perform so so good after my periods but it took me ages to figure that out it was later on in my career that I realized that maybe it should have been at the start you know I think women we need to be open a lot more and not just it's not our fault at all but I mean like the people just yeah be able to talk about it in a comfortable manner. Ellie also opened up about the impact of the bullying culture that existed in para swimming ahead of Rio 2016. And you mentioned obviously your fantastic coach from from Swansea you had such a positive experience there and that's continued through uh, and obviously reflected in your success in Beijing and, and London but but sadly there were issues with a bit of a bullying culture in para swimming ahead of Rio 2016 and you'd moved to Manchester to the high performance center so I wonder how that hostile environment with with that coach not the coach that you had for all those years uh, but how did that impact you and your performance you know what? Um, I think actually it still impacts me sometimes now. Oh, wow. And I don't, haven't really, yeah, I think it's, it's crazy when you, you're, I think this, it shouldn't be like when you're in an environment that someone is putting you down every single day and something that you think you're good at and they tell you you're not good at it. It's those words, it's the mannerisms and, it's, it definitely has a massive, massive impact. And especially when you're performing as in sport, it's, it's hard, it's pressurized, it's hard, it's not easy. Like, it's not something like, yeah, you see us at, um, at a Paralympics or an Olympics and it's all amazing, but there's, it's, it's tough. Like, and especially swimming, it's, you're in the costume, you know. I remember I used to be, I was so skinny. Like looking back, I remember I used to weigh myself every single day. I used to have like half a bagel because I was worried about my weight. And it was a very, very tough time. But also as well, I look back and I think it made me now realize that like people like that who who put people down, like now I've got more confidence to, to stand up for myself, but also my teammates as well. And hopefully as well, it's given a wake up call to, to British swimming, but also in sport in general that that shouldn't be, you know, it's about being when you've got a coach or when you've got your team your your team around you that they should work to in to to better you not just as an athlete but as a person and putting yourself down and telling you using that old characteristic way and that old style of coaching just doesn't work to have that open relationship and talking and to to support the person as a human and not just an athlete yeah it's it's better but you live and learn and stuff and yeah he's not that individual isn't in the sport hopefully not but I don't know and do you think that British sport is better now in terms of finding that balance between athlete welfare and the pursuit of Olympic and Paralympic medals I can I can only vouch for swimming but I think it's getting better I think what's happened in the past they've learned from it um again I'm not much into that world at the moment so I don't know but um from when we had our moment and the time in, in Rio and afterwards, it definitely changed. But again, I hope it has and I hope it's staying 
in the positive way and I hope it continues and you learn from it and I know that British gymnastics and gymnastics as a whole has had it and it's happened a few times in sport and hopefully for future athletes and not just the youngsters grassroots and Olympians Paralympians that it doesn't happen. Juliet Slot, now Chief Commercial Officer at Arsenal Football Club, reflected on her experience as the first female director at Fulham Football Club. And how has the environment for women working in football changed since you were there in the 90s? So what, what differences have you seen? Well, for the first, for the point is I, I arrived at Arsenal two years ago and I sit on an executive board where we're 50-50 women. I mean, that change in itself is huge compared to my time at Fulham, uh, where I was the only woman on the board. There were two clubs where I wasn't allowed to go to away games. I'm not going to mention <gasps> them. One club I wasn't actually allowed to go to the boardroom. And another club, when I went up there, I was ushered out of the director's dining room to go and eat with the wives. Even though they knew you were a director? Yeah. And actually, to the credit of my then chief executive, he said, I'm not eating with the directors. I'm going to eat with you, Juliet. And I've never forgotten that about him because it meant so much to me. And we were all rather surprised by it because it didn't exist at Fulham. So, yeah, it's. Uh, I don't think there were any club would have been able to do that today. But it was something I experienced. Um, sexism, you know, was was quite rife. Just in the te- way you were treated, like, oh, well, you don't, you're a woman, you don't understand football. Um, oh, you're a marketing person, you don't understand football. So a lot of language in corridors or the way you're treated. Whereas now I don't, I don't even think about whether I'm a woman. Uh, at Arsenal in particular, we, it, 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 I, I think I'm, you know, I'm here because I'm hopefully doing a really good job as chief commercial officer, and I just happen to be a woman. And I, you know, we have. My department, we have almost equal male, female. Um, I'm really strong on building the diversity across the whole department, but it's so different now um, to where I was at Fulham, where we had a very small number of women in in the club. Did you ever feel like almost like it wasn't a place that you wanted to be because it was a, a sport that didn't want you? Or I, I sense that isn't how you are as a character. I think what it what it the behaviours that it developed in me were behaviours that I've had to undo, in that I had to become a battler. And um, I'm, you know, I am a battler and I I was fighting to kind of move up the greasy pole, as I say. And I don't need to be like that as much uh, here at Arsenal at all, actually. And whereas I think, you know, I had to, I was always trying to kind of fight. And and what I did was I worked hard. I worked harder and longer than some of my male counterparts because I felt I had to prove myself, which is tiring. I was doing that at the same time as um, also having three children, working full time. So it's, uh, yeah, it was pretty exhausting and I think quite lonely at times because I didn't really have anyone to talk to about how I felt. And so I sort of thought this was a norm. And actually, I look back on it now thinking, gosh, if I'd known what I know now, I would have actually talked more openly to found some female mentors. I would have actually talked to the the people I worked for and explained how I felt and how I'd been treated. But you didn't think you could have those conversations in those days, whereas you can now. A panel episode focused on the lack of senior female coaches in sport and international coach Kelly Lindsay gave some fascinating insight into the world of professional football. Where we're at with now with women's sports is we really all need to be thinking as organizational bodies and governing bodies, what does the women's game need? And what do women in our game need, whether they're coaching the men, the youth, the women's side, whatever, We are not making decisions based on what the women need because it's very rare that you sit in a room and dialogue about the experience of a woman in these sporting environments. People are not asking how we walk in our shoes. Men are not asking to walk in our shoes. They're not asking us questions. It's very, very rare when I sit with a man that he ever truly asks about my deep experience in sport what's been harmful, what's been helpful, how I got there, rarely. It's always a talk, it's banter, it's just talking about the game, it's just talking about the game. And that's where men align with other men. So if we can create more of a dialogue, because you're asking us to walk in your shoes, but you're not asking what it's like to walk in our shoes. And when that dialogue comes across governing bodies and organizations, things will change because the men who will have that dialogue, who are great allies, suddenly go, oh my gosh, Yeah, I've never thought about that. Makes total sense. Why don't we do that? So I think that's when you know you have a true ally, people who really want to develop the women's game because they're asking the right questions. And I think when you ask the right questions, it gets very strategic and understandable. And then barriers can be removed quite quickly because it's just 
some of the things are so simple, but if you just don't have the dialogue, you're going to miss them. And I think the other side to it is we're comparing practical opportunities. Let's use England football for an example on the women's side. You have 24, only 24 clubs who might, who might have a full-time female coach. Not even a female coach. Might have a full-time opportunity for a female coach. 24. And I know out of those 24, they're not all full-time coaches. So in this entire country, if a woman can only go coaching women's football, she probably has 22 opportunities on her CV to say she's a full-time head football coach. Men in this country have how many layers, four layers of professional, how many layers into non-league to say that they are a professional? Because if a man puts it on his resume, he's a professional. But if a woman puts it, she's in tier four, she's not a professional. So the actual practical opportunities that come up on a CV, which means organizationally, we need to change the way we recruit. We need to change the way we interview. We need to change the system and the process of how we go find females and how we take them on the journey and how we bring them into our club. So future proofing and future planning. I'm going to go find the best females. I'm going to bring them in at whatever level that that is right for them. And I'm going to plan to support them for the next 10 years because they are the future of my club. That is rarely happening in women's sports. Most clubs and most people who recruit for a women's job will say, oh, no women applied. And it's true. They don't. But a big piece to going and getting women is caring enough to going and getting women and having the dialogue and figuring out why they didn't apply. So most of them don't apply because they've had a horrific experience in sport at some point. They've been cut down. There's so many cuts, the knives in the back, the set up for failure. All, so have a dialogue, understand why they're not applying, meet them where they're at, take them on a development journey and future plan. But most clubs and organizations don't take the time for that. But if we really care about the women's game, then we really have to think, what do those women's games need? Where is it at now? And how do we plan for five or 10 years of success? Guardian journalist Susie Rack called out the gender inequality in sports writing. Obviously, we've seen great improvements in terms of gender equality across sport, but that's not always the case in sports journalism. It was really depressing to be at the Sports Journalist Awards last year and see those constant shortlists of six white men, six white men, six white men. So I guess what's your experience been of that gender balance in, in sports reporting? And do you think things are changing? And obviously, The Guardian's leading the way there, but across the, the print um, area, do you feel things are changing? They, they are. Um, I thought there would be more change after the Euros win than there has been. I think some outlets have actually sort of stepped back a little bit rather than stepped forward in a way that I didn't expect. I, you know, I just assumed it would be sort of continued growth everywhere like it is being for us. And I, I very much get the impression that that's not the case and that the commitment is very much sort of based on, you know, who's in the senior roles at, at what time and, and and that can make all the difference. Whereas, I mean, I'm really, really lucky at The Guardian that the commitment is like just so f- like uh, from the top, you know, my two main editors um, take their, you know, their daughters both play football. They take their daughters to games that I'm sat in the press box covering. You know, there's a real like they, they enjoy it. Um, it's not just, you know, sort of tokenistic. So that like... You know, I don't think like yeah, I think I sort of assumed that everywhere was like that, and everyone would be on the sort of Euros hype train, and you know, wanting to do do more after the uh, England's Euros win. But that's not really necessarily been the case everywhere in the way that I I maybe expected it would, which is disappointing, but um, but also not not that surprising in some respects. I mean, like say the awards, I just uh, it, it, I, what I find really disappointing is if it had been the men's team winning the Euros. Uh, or or World Cup for the first time, it would be, you know, every single award would be dominated by that victory. And I get that there were other big stories last year. You know, there was Ukraine, you know, big social events going on that, that pushed the Euros sort of, not down the pecking order, but just alongside it were some of the biggest stories of the year. I just think the idea that if that was a men's team winning, that that wouldn't have been the top story and wouldn't have dominated is is just unconscionable it would have it would have done but yet you know you get no women's football writer nominated for sports writer for sports writer of the year or football writer of the year in the year that England women have won a Euros and you know I'm not saying that should 
it should be automatic. It was just the quality of the writing around that tournament was so good. It was so high. So many did such a good job. And there was so much passion poured into into the writing around it and a lot of emotion, particularly from some of the people who have covered it for a very, very, very long time and have followed the journeys of these players who, you know, we've seen playing whilst working full-time jobs and things like that. To For that to not be recognised, for that storytelling not to be recognised, just really frustrating me because I was like, who who's making this decision? Who is saying that there shouldn't be a women's football writer in the year that England women have won the Euros? on the list of football writers of the year. Like that for me is just like mad. And obviously there's some brilliant men's football writing as well. I don't know. I just still think there's a little bit of a, it's a stepping stone attitude to to the industry generally. Um, and I think there's even that amongst some women's football journalists as well, um, that, that, you know, are viewing it as a platform into the men's game or the little sister of the men's game. And they want to do both or whatever it may be. Um, that's never, ever been my like my goal has never been to be a men's football journalist. Susie also shared her thoughts on the action of the Spanish players after the Football World Cup. What I mean by their enough is enough moment is like for so long, women have put up with um, a lot um, and women in football have put up with a lot. And it, it's very much been a sort of whatever crumbs from the table we get and we're grateful for and let's not rock the boat too much for more, you know. So like in, in the case of the Sp- Spain players... They could have stopped their fight when the manager was sacked. They could have stopped their fight when Rubiales finally resigned, the president of the federation. You know, there, there's all these points at which they could have said, right, job done, back to work. And they've not, they've seen it as a responsibility to go further. They've recognised as well that they have the power to keep pushing at the door and to make more sustained and substantive change than just the superficial, right, let's clear out this first layer of um, misogynistic men just for the next wave (laughs) to come in in their place who are part of the same system that they have built and cultivated and I just think it's such a a key moment in that you know they are willing to keep going beyond that and they've seen that this is the time that they can keep demanding change and make it happen beyond you know just the superficial or the right quick now get our heads back down and let's get on with the football kind of thing and I like that feels like a really important moment for me and a really important lesson for women in society generally that you know you win one thing and you don't have to stop there you don't have to go right oh thank god phew we've 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 won that now let's you know oh we've got um uh equal pay for you know the u.s women's national team players we've got oh we've got equal pay let's keep our heads down now or whatever they can you can go much much further than that you don't have to put down the microphone and go right now let's keep quiet for a bit because we've won that and we you know we've got to be good for a little bit so that they don't you know kind of think we're just up on a high horse or whatever and I think that's a really important thing and I think we're already seeing others take it on I mean when you look at how outspoken England have been after the Euros win on um, access in schools on their bonuses on uh, commercial rights on just the the you know the future um, you know not letting the government put out a statement saying yes we're gonna honor all these agreements and then leaving it you know they're chasing it up they're following it they're not gonna let it just be a uh something that's paid lip service to and a bit of pr yeah so yeah i think people are starting to learn those lessons and that for me is exciting and a like really important moment because that's when you get like more systemic change when you start to challenge things at a much deeper level when you're pushing beyond those like the, the individuals that are the problem to it being a more systemic thing i think is what needs to happen UFC champion Molly Meatball McCann spoke about how her upbringing in Liverpool has shaped the fighter she became. I come from a, a Muslim family who just grew up in a time in a city where there was not much to do other than a lot of crime probably and a lot of addiction. They whether it be gambling, drinking or drugs. And it was just, it was not probably what kids would, you'd never imagine for your kids to have to live through. And I just remember being very young and always having a lot of compass, like walking into, being in my room, coming downstairs thinking, why aren't these people asleep? Why are people still partying in my house, like getting up to no good? And I'd come downstairs and look at these people and think, they're just, I'm talking four, five and six, there is no way I'm ending up like this. And my moral compass just knew, like, 
I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. And you're probably really born with this. But I was reading a book on emotional intelligence, just always trying to understand my trauma and why I am the way I am and why I dig deeper than most in certain positions or certain parts of life, I suppose. And it's because you forged with what you go through. And I think the more adversity that you receive, you have to go through at a younger age normally means that there's nothing really that you can't manage to wiggle your way through as you get older. So, like, sometimes I get it wrong. I get through it, but I've acted incorrectly or I've probably done something negative on the way to get out when I was a lot younger. But I, I feel like I wouldn't change one step in the journey of my family or myself. I'm not ashamed of anything I've done or anything that my family's done and I've had to get bear that weight of, of that as well because they they brought me up with brilliant models to be respectful, to to push the envelope, to push the boundary of anything and they always made me believe I could achieve anything that I ever wanted. Former Olympian turned sports broadcaster Jeanette Quachi opened up on the issue of sports kit for young women. Really interesting, you're kind of stepping away from sport in those teenage years. And we see lots of stuff, don't we, about teenage girls dropping out of sport and a lot around sports clothing. We're having more conversations about clothing. And I just wondered from you as a track athlete, whether you ever had any issues, challenges, whether you had discussions around the kit that you yeah. competed in or whether you just accepted that because you were a, a kind of female track athlete. It's really it's such an interesting conversation. It's so nuanced, isn't it? So I love my track kit I mean I'd wear the smallest crop top I'd have the tiniest pants because I just I just thought okay I I wanted to look good and I was I was super body confident now that's a personality thing it's a huge personality thing because there were girls that I'd compete against that had the longest shorts possible and the biggest vests to wear do you know what I mean and it is completely down to how you feel as an individual now I can see why it can be incredibly problematic. I was at a school sports football tournament just a couple of weeks ago and um, it was a mixed football tournament, five aside, year sixes, and all the girls were in PE skirts. And I just did, I, and I was like, what? We are in 2023. You know, I left school over 20 years ago, nearly 25 years ago. And I am shocked that this is, this is still the norm. Like, put these girls in shorts, let them feel comfortable. We've had so many conversations around it and let them make that decision further down the line if they then want to be able to to wear things that are a little bit more standardised when it comes down to, to kits and sport with women. But I personally didn't necessarily have a problem with it, but I can see massively now why, you know, it's problematic. And now that you look back, you can see why other girls would be handed in fake sick pee notes yeah. and... You know, all that kind of stuff because you just, if you're not confident, you don't want to wear it. But, you know, like I say, as, as I've got older and the empathy's kind of kicked in, I'm like, oh gosh, yeah, that must have been really challenging for, you know, I can name tens of girls who don't want to do it at school. But now you really see it for what it is. And maybe that's because I'm a mum or, you know, I've had a bit of time and I've worked with so many young people. You can really see why it can be problematic. If you enjoyed listening to some of our highlights from 2023, you can find the full interviews and over 160 episodes on all podcast channels or at fearlesswomen.co.uk. As well as listening to all of the podcasts on the website, you can also find out more about the Women's Sport Collective, a free, inclusive community for all women working in sport. Thanks once again to Sport England for backing the Game Changers through the National Lottery and also to Sam Walker at What Goes On Media who does such a great job as our executive producer. Thank you also to my brilliant colleague at Fearless Women, Kate Hannon. Do follow us now to make sure you don't miss out on that new series and if you have a moment to leave a rating or a review it would be fantastic as it really does help us to reach new audiences. Come and say hello on social media where you'll find me on LinkedIn, Instagram and Twitter at Sue Anstis. The Game Changers. Fearless women in sport.